Welcome, everybody. Um, today is Friday, October 2nd. This is Music Cities Together Live, our weekly conversation program about what's happening in this unbelievably complicated and uh, off the rails year of 2020 as it relates to music and communities and cities and activism and engagement and reopening our music scenes and everything else that, that we uh, possibly could even think about cramming into these conversations. Uh, as always, we are so appreciative of you spending some of your Friday with us. We know you're extraordinarily busy. You have a lot of things on your plate, a lot of ways you can be spending your time. And uh, we really appreciate you spending uh, some of your time with us. We have a really exciting program today with some fantastic guests, and, and we can't wait to get into the conversation. Um, but before we do that, as always, we, we want to start with a couple of um, couple of updates, because I, I don't know if everybody's heard, but there's, uh, there's a little bit of news. So... Um, the most relevant news for us today um, probably is, is not related to uh, the election, uh, although clearly that's important, and, and it's not necessarily related um, to some health news that, that came out earlier today, which is, is also important. Uh, I would suggest that the most uh, directly important uh, update for us today, for people who participate in this program, uh, was the jobs report. Today, the, the last jobs report came out um, that will be issued before the election and the news was bad. Um, it certainly was not great. And uh, really what that means uh, for us in terms of the way that these issues are gonna play out over the next uh, week or two before the election uh, is now there's even more of an incentive and impetus for Speaker Pelosi and the White House and the Senate to reach some sort of final accommodation in terms of a stimulus package, uh, which uh, as of now, if the stimulus package did go through, uh, would include $10 billion uh, in funding for Save Our Stages, along with additional resources for state and local government and, and unemployment extensions and things like that. So, um, you know, clearly th this morning's news is overshadowed by the president's health and the implications on the election and all that. But, you know, really the, the, the thing that we need to keep our eye on is the pressure on the job market and, and the potential macroeconomic pressures that's going to create over the next month before the election, and even more of a need, again, for the administration and Congress to reach some accommodation. Um, I'm really excited uh, in, in our next segment, um, in about 20 minutes, we're going to be talking with, with Sean Watterson as part of our Cleveland conversation. Sean has been driving a lot of the advocacy at the national level through NEVA and some of the local and state advocacy uh, through his work in Cleveland, and, and so we'll be talking in more detail about what's happening um, and his sense of, of where this is and where this is going. So with that, we're, we're, we, we have two topics we're, we're really gonna focus on today. Uh, again, later in the show, we're gonna continue our weekly check-ins uh, with Music Cities and, and just get a sense of um, what people are feeling, how people are doing, some of the actions that they're taking in 2020, what does this mean for the broader context of art and culture and music moving forward. Again, we're thrilled this week, we're gonna be talking to some of our colleagues in, in Cleveland and Akron and, and talk about you know, the Ohio music scene and what's going on there. Uh, before that, we're gonna revisit a topic that we uh, always enjoy, uh, which is data and um, uses of data, how we can measure things which are very difficult to measure and some different ways that, that we can, um, some tools that potentially we could leverage uh, not only today and tomorrow, but also as a field, as we think about the evolution of access to data and how we as activists or policymakers or uh, people who care deeply about music ecosystems can be applying these tools. So, so let me start the show today and, and bring in Kelly Ernst and, and uh, Trevor McElhaney from Western States Arts Federation. Kelly and, and Trevor, welcome. Can you, there you go. Hey there. Hi, Michael. It's magic. It's magic. And I, I need to say at the front end, um, our wonderful producer, Alex Dolvin, who has been with us every Friday and has done an amazing job uh, with our back end logistics and keeping the show working. Alex is not with us today. And uh, in our pre show, Kelly was a savior, making sure that everybody's camera worked and all that great stuff. So thank you, Kelly, for pitching in and, and helping make things work. And uh, and just a, a logistics note for those of you who follow the show, uh, Alex normally is the person doing the amazing job putting all the relevant links in chat. That will be me today. So I will be talking to our guests. I will be fielding questions and I'll be putting things in chat. So if things get a little 
you know, a little rocky. That's that's because we don't have our producer, but then we'll, we'll get through it. We'll soldier through. So anyway, so um, Trevor and Kelly, thank you again for joining us. Um, let's just for starters, uh, I think many folks uh, participating in today's meeting know all too well what West Def is all about. But for those who are new to the conversation and haven't had a chance to work with you, tell us a little bit about Western States Arts Federation and, and what you do there. Absolutely. Um, thank you again, Michael, for having us. It's really exciting to be here and be talking with everyone. Um, briefly, the Western States Arts Federation is a regional arts organization. It is the mission of West Staff to promote arts advocacy, specifically in the West. Um, we have other counterparts that are doing this work as well in other regions, um, but we're f specifically focusing on the West, the Western regions, um, the 13 Western states. Trevor and I um, specifically work for a data tool called the Creative Vitality Suite. Um, it is one of many technology products that West Staff um, operates. Creative Vitality Suite is a data we is a data collection tool, and we are not Western specific. Um, we look at the entire United States collectively, um, and we analyze the creative economies. We look at um, labor market data to understand what's really going on in our creative communities um, across the across the board. I'm the uh, business coordinator for West Def, or excuse me, for CV Suite, and then Trevor here is our data analyst. Um, so he's the one who has all of the data answers and can help people understand really what they have and how to connect the dots, so to speak, how to develop the stories that is, as everyone I'm sure knows, is all too important for the work, the advocacy work that we are all engaged with. Well, I really am, am excited um, for you to share some of the, the work that you've been doing. And, and I, I think it, it, you know, to build on what we we're saying just a few minutes ago, one of the sort of structural challenges with, with music or cultural advocacy is that we all tend to go by our gut. There's a very natural um, sort of inclination to sort of feel like things are happening. So maybe artists are touring a lot more, making money off that, or maybe the royalties are bad from Spotify, or maybe, maybe, and, and you know, it's, it's been a structural challenge in this work going back 25 years to be able to actually put numbers behind it that are meaningful numbers, you know, and, and there's a secondary challenge or just because you have numbers behind something that may not tell the story you actually think it tells. I mean, so there's a whole complexity to, you know, how we access data and how we use data, but you guys have, have uh, released something fun this week that, that we really enjoyed. Could you tell us a little bit about what, uh, what you announced or what you, uh, what you reported on? Sure thing. Um, so over the course of this last year, we have been working on a campaign that we're very, very excited of and very, very proud of. It's, um, we're calling, it's called the Creative Vitality List. So what we're doing is putting together lists, highlighting the vibrancy of creative communities across the United States. Um, every list, with each release of the list, we have a different theme, so to speak. Um, the first iteration of our list, the first ever list, which was released in last spring, we looked at the general creative concentration of, of regions across the US. We recently launched our second list. Um, we launched it on Wednesday. And this is a list that it's highlighting music cities and music, small music economies across the US. Um, we focused on, and my data analyst Trevor can really help us dive through the data, but we focused on small, small cities, or rather less than 500,000 people. Um, and we focused on a concentration of musicians, singers, related workers to see really what's going on in these regions. Yeah. So I would love for you to, to walk us through this and, and, uh, and maybe share screen and kind of just give us a, you know, let's, let's see who are some of the cities that you held up. I, I think one of the things I, I do want to emphasize um, before we go through the list, I mean, first of all, I think we all know that lists are silly, right? And, you know, lists are fun because it, it's a great way to frame conversations and, and all this. But something that I, I think we really valued in terms of, of this list is, you know, for, for, for most of us, the point of the Music Cities conversation is for every city to understand what does it mean to be the best version of themselves. And that can be a big city, that can be a small community, that can be everything in between. And I think what, what, what you know, our audience is going to see in a minute here as you kind of walk us through this is really neat examples of communities that you wouldn't necessarily associate if you didn't know them or, or had thought about them as 
really emphasizing the role of music in, in, in their, uh, in, in their life and in, in their, um, you know, in, in the whole, you know, sort of community of, 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 of um, anyway, in their community. So I'll stop there. So anyway, do you, one of you want to share screen and walk us through this a little bit? Absolutely. I can absolutely do that. Um, thank you for saying that, Michael. We, we really believe over here that, and the point, you know, the list is a light, casual, fun thing yeah. to do, but we really believe that what it shows is that every region, every city, no matter how big or small, does have a unique story to share. And exactly. the data absolutely can support that story. Um, and, and that's what we want to really exhibit with these lists. So with that said, let me share my screen and I will bring you guys to um, our creative vitality list, the top 10 music cities that you need to know about. And everyone follow, does everyone see? And folks, if you have, have questions, um, please feel free to use the Q&A window um, and, you know, or potentially the chat window, either one is, is fine. And, um, happy to get to as many questions as we can in this segment. And I know Kelly and Trevor are excited to follow up after the show. We'll have contact information when they're done talking about this. All right. So let's see the 10 <laughs> music cities we need to know about. All right. Um, now I'm kind of debating in my head. Do we want to tell you what the, what the number one city is, or do we want to talk you through the data methodology first? Um, Real quick to methodology. Okay, great. So I will actually bring it over to Trevor, um, our data analyst for CV Suite, and he can talk about exactly how we decided what makes a music city. Um, as you can see, I'm just scrolling through our campaign site. Um, so yeah, what makes a music city? And I will dive into the data right now. Trevor, I will let you take over. Can you hear me first? Well, Kelly, while Trevor's getting that going, so the CV Suite product or platform is probably more of a platform is Something that's mostly used by what arts councils, some cities, some counties, like who are typical users who would be partnering with West Staff on deploying this research locally? Right. Can you hear me? Yeah, oh. you're, there you go, Trevor. There we go. I think the mic on my other headphones are messed up, but okay. Um, so to just kind of start with with the the methodology behind the data. Um, first and foremost, to put it in kind of context, like we've been talking about. Um, we definitely wanted to put something together that was digestible and super easy to follow. It's all about having fun and to Kelly's point, drawing, um, high, highlighting uh, regions and areas and musical communities that normally don't get a ton of attention. And that's really the context and how we built the list. That being said, the specific way that we did it was looking at location quotient of very specific um, occupation, which is the musicians, uh, uh, singers, and related workers. Again, you could build this list multiple different ways, but what we found by uh, through research is just that this is a, a way of looking at the concentration of, of, of workers in a way that does draw highlight that does highlight the regions that don't typically get looked at um, on the website as you can see you can kind of more thoroughly go through our methodology I don't want to get too in the weeds mm -hmm. about it or again um, I'm sure our contact information is in there and if anyone wants to know more you can definitely reach out to me I'm more than happy to geek out on on numbers <laughs> and statistics and, and methodologies behind numbers so feel free anyone to do that um, the, the other thing that we did do is pare down the 926 um, uh, uh, CBSAs to ones that are less than 500,000. Again, try to limit the, you know, it's like, we all know that places like Seattle, LA, are, are you know, even Austin are big music um, uh, cities. And we really wanted to highlight those areas that, that, that again, um, are a little bit more rural or, or, you know, the, the workers there may not necessarily get the attention that other places do. So Kelly on that, I'll let you continue kind of the, the big drum roll of who's on it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so with all the data analysis that we did, we um, came up as Trevor said with this music location quotient. Um, there's a few maps and graphs on our, on, as a part of this campaign um, that can really help that um, actually highlights what the actual data is for each creative town. You can see uh, Flagstaff, Arizona. We have data on them. We've got Casper, Wyoming. 
their music location. They, they're ranked 311 out of 817. So there's a lot of fun visuals to play with as well if you're curious about your own regions. Um, all right, so our very, very, uh, our 10th city, that the city that came in 10th, I'm going backwards. <laughs> so I'm, there you go. I'm um, giving you a little snapshot. We had Pittsfield, Massachusetts. Um, Pittsfield actually is a town that has now ranked twice on our lists. Uh, the first time, as I mentioned earlier, we had a list highlighting the general creative vitality of a region. We came up with a with an index. It's actually something that we use frequently in our work. We call it the Creative Vitality Index. Um, we used those to see what the what the top the top thirty cities were. And Pittsfield actually made an appearance on that list. Um, we have Lawrence, Kansas. I'm not sure if you guys, here we go. We have Lawrence, Kansas. Um, they came up as number nine with a music location of 1.75. Um, again, really exciting to see some of these smaller regions popping up. Um, and for us, it was really exciting to work with the towns and work with the, the um, arts communities in those places to kind of see exactly why they exactly why they landed on the list. Another thing that we're always talking about and promoting in CV Suite is that everyone has a music story. And Michael, I love how you said this. Um, any city can be an art city and every city has creativity. It's just about understanding the data and understanding what's going on on the ground. Um, so we had a really good time collecting information on some of these amazing festivals, um, amazing concert series that these small cities are doing. Reducium, New Mexico ranked number eight for us. We actually had a, a fun time seeing that New Mexico came, they ranked three cities um, on the list of 10. So three of 10 were at our top, um, uh, top music loca location quotient, which was, in my opinion, a great reason when all of this is over to check out what uh, New Mexico is doing musically. <laughs> And this is also something that we hope that these lists can show is that, you know, this idea of slow tourism in a way where it's not about going to the big Austins, the Nashvilles, although those places are great. It's, um, it's about going to these smaller regions and really checking out what's happening there. So New Mexico, put it on your list, everyone, put it on your list. <laughs> Oak, Har Oak Harbor, Washington came in seventh. Uh, their music LQ was 1.85. Um, and followed by Hudson, New York, which is 2.03. Um, Hudson, New York has a lot of activity. We've been hearing about them uh, quite a bit, so it's exciting to see them on the list as well. I will save the middle regions so you guys can actually find them out yourself, and I will skip all the way down to number one. Um, in place was Branson, Missouri. Branson, Missouri had the highest mu music location quotient of 3.14, um, which made them first in our list. So if anyone's from Branson in this, in this chat, please uh, make yourself known. Um, if you have any, any, any kind of plug, now would be the time. <laughs> but again, we had such a good time researching these cities, connecting with people who are working in them, um, working, working for these organizations uh, that are doing great music work um, and kind of just figuring out what's happening there. So that is the big reveal. That is number one. That's great. Uh, vitality list. <laughs> I love it. Kelly and Trevor, that, that's so fun. And, and thanks for putting the data sources in, in the chat. Um, and, and let's speak to Stacey uh, Frazier's got a great question um, where she asked basically that regions with vibrant creative output in one field also excel in others is something that you say on, on, on your website. And she'd love to know, and, and we love to know kind of like, how do you, like what sources do you draw from to kind of substantiate the, the statement, you know, especially kind of the the cross sector or the cross discipline, um, you know, kind of linkages in, in music communities. Absolutely. Trevor, do you want to take this question? Yeah, I'll take that. Um, so I actually, to her question, I did just post our um, uh, major data sources. And what you'll see there is um, CV Suite, we focus specifically on labor force and economic data, uh, which is, you know, different than some other people. We don't really rely too heavily on things like uh, uh, um, uh, 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 survey data, so that's one, that's kind of our perspective on things. It's not the full, full story, but it's, it's one that we try to tell just because of, of consistency and some other factors. That being said, um, as you can see, we, we do a lot with um, 
BEA, uh, the Bureau of Labor Statistics, the census, um, IRS data. And through that, we compile it all into um, essentially one number. That's the location quotient. And then that's going to compare things like jobs within a region as a concentration versus other larger uh, regions. In this instance, it's uh, versus the United States as a whole. Um, again, I could definitely go more into detail on how that's all done, but I hopefully that kind of answers your question as far as uh, what our sources are. That's great. No, Trevor, I think that's fantastic. And, you know, I think the, um, you know, part of one of the reasons we wanted to have you on today, other than just really getting a kick out of the, you know, the, the release around the 10 cities and, and our longstanding admiration for West Staff is, you know, this conversation fits into, again, as we're all getting ready for 2021 and the future, you know, I think one of the most important conversations that's happening in the field is how do we rethink data? And to a large extent, you know, we've had an evolution in the, in, in the music field over the last 20 years. Again, like I said before, starting with not a lot of quantitative data collection and then sort of new different models. And there's been, you know, kind of survey-based models or census-based models or CD suite or other ways of sort of looking at, you know, how do you slice and dice and, and understand music and in, in, in all of its complexity. And I, I think where it, it feels like it's moving um, in the next couple of years, and again, some of this is pending. I mean, again, none of these issues are political. These issues are political only in the context of the people in power being interested in to engage in these conversations and in this work. And, and I think, you know, one of the challenges that I would imagine Trevor and, and Kelly and your whole team has kind of dealt with from the beginning is that again, you're being reactive because you're dealing with federal coding and federal data as they're pushing things out. And what we are all interested in, we've had a lot of conversations on this program about this and, and others is how do we sort of challenge in a collaborative way, how do we challenge the sort of data keeping to have a better reflection of the complexity of the artistic experience. You know, musicians are often not captured in labor data. Um, people who are music advocates are almost never captured in labor, labor data. These things typically aren't jobs. You know, the things, the work that I do is not a job job, right? I mean, I spend a lot of my time working on music, but that doesn't get reflected in sort of labor or taxes or things like that. And, and so we're really excited about, you know, again, coming out of the nightmare of 2020, one of, the, one of the major sort of tangible things that we're excited about as an organization and as a community is what does that conversation look like to be able to, again, to go to all the different, you know, sort of agencies where there also is, you know, I think one of the under, under, understood, I can't talk today, one of the less understood trends in Washington that has happened over the last decades certainly is, is much more of an embracing of evidence-based policymaking. And uh, there was a, a commission that Congress created, a commission on evidence-based policymaking that has led to a number of tangible initiatives to really rethink data and, and, and data access and data collection and, you know, sort of how we do all this stuff. And, and so I think that there's some dots that we're excited to connect between, again, you know, the success of Saver, Saver Stages and the importance of the cultural sector and, and the intersection of federal policy and culture with the data and all these other pieces. So, so we're thrilled, you know, to have you join us today. Um, excited for the report that, you're, that you all have put out. Um, I, I know a lot of people, again, who, who follow our work um, have had great success working with CV Suite and, and understanding these tools. And um, I know folks will be excited to kind of follow up with you and just learn more about what you guys are offering and, you know, kind of where we're collectively taking this work as, as we move forward. Absolutely. And thank you again, Michael, for having us. Again, this is a conversation that we're so excited to be on. Just to re reiterate what you said, as we move forward trying to understand evidence-based policymaking, it is so exciting for us um, as a data tool to be working with people to help understand um, truly the data strategy and data education. So often it's a scary thing. Um, and we really want to make sure that people know that, in fact, it's just about learning. It's just about knowing where to look and knowing how to tell the story and knowing that different sources can come in together to create this big, broad picture. Um, it, it really can be impactful and there's, a, and there's a way to do it. And there's a way to work together so that everyone involved in this advocacy work truly understands the data. Awesome. So that's what awesome. we're here for. 
Kelly and Trevor, thank you so much for joining us and give our best regards to your West Staff colleagues and, and we're excited to keep working with you. I know I see at least another question in the chat, Trevor, if you can, or Kelly, just answer some, if there are any additional questions in the chat and, and just make sure your contact information is in there. That would be awesome. Yeah, we'll stick right. off the questions. So we'll, we'll be answering. Awesome. I'm answering that right now. So, all right, bye guys. Thanks guys. Let's move to Ohio. Sean and Mark and Jill and Leandra, if you could, could join us, we're um, excited to have you. Uh, so again, this is uh, our second check-in with our, our city partners. We, we were doing a series of these again uh, throughout the fall to just kind of get a snapshot of what's happening in music scenes, music communities, um, especially communities that have been working closely with us as part of the REVS initiative. Um, last week, we had a really wonderful conversation with Seattle and King County, just kind of checking in with what's happening from a bunch of perspectives there. Um, we're thrilled you guys are, are joining us, and, and I'm going to start with, uh, with Sean. So, oh, Sean, how Hi, are you today? How are you today? It's been a, it's been a slog. Yeah, riding the roller coaster. Um, so, oh, go ahead, please. Yeah, well, um, you know, today... This week has been encouraging in some ways, but the the entire summer has been been a sort of a hurry up and wait, uh, feeling like we are right on the verge of getting assistance at the federal level, and then feeling like the goalposts are getting moved on us. But um, as as you pointed out on our pre call, uh, the the latest on the national front seems to be trending positive. Um, with Save Our Stages included in the House Democrats bill and in Treasury Secretary Mnuchin's counter proposal. And then um, news, I guess, just in the last hour, I keep furiously checking my phone and refreshing, that uh, Pelosi seems to be um, sending signals that uh, there is room for compromise, yeah. especially in light of the jobs data, but also the, the COVID diagnosis. Yeah. So. Well, let's let's back out a little bit and let's mm -hmm. let's start. And you know, I'm I'm fascinated by your background, Sean. So why don't you tell us a little bit about how you got into music and, and tell us about Happy Dog for those of us who uh, have not had the benefit of, of spending time in Cleveland. Sure. Um, so my history is I I can't really hold a job for very long. So <laughs> prior to prior to starting the Happy Dog. Uh, 12 years ago, which, which is my longest stretch. Um, I was in finance. I was a um, stockbroker and a municipal bond trader. I went to law school um, and did international law and ended up at the Securities and Exchange Commission in their Office of International Affairs the day before 9-11. Mm -hmm. And so spent much of the next 10 years working on anti-money laundering and counterterrorism finance issues. Um, especially international standards. Um, and in a weird way, that's what led me to music because most of what we were doing was trying to manage risks and our only measure of success was if nothing bad happened. And you had no way of knowing whether that was because of what you did or because nothing bad was going to happen anyway. Um, so for me, coming back to Cleveland, where I'm from, from in D.C., and starting the Happy Dog was a way of having a positive impact on the local level. Every night, we have the opportunity to do something that has a positive impact on our community. And the risk is that nobody shows up, which is a much lower risk than the risk of something absolutely terrible happening. Um, and so that's what we did. You know, we've, we made the decision out of the gate to support live and we pay musicians 100% of the door um, because we knew that they needed to be able to afford to make music and we needed to make that investment in them. Um, and then we've also used it as a, as a community space kind of for everything else we're interested in. We have a, mm -hmm. a world affairs talk series, Happy Dog Takes on the World. We have a science talk series uh, called Life, the Universe and Hot Dogs. And for those who don't know, uh, happy dog, our specialty is hot dogs. So, um, but we really view ourselves as, as a community asset and a community, community space. Um, and we take that 
responsibility seriously and we take that commitment seriously. Um, it's also why it's been so hard to be shut down during COVID, but we also take that seriously, the, the health and safety of our employees, but also all of the musicians and academics and, and everyone who takes our stage. Yeah. And, you know, something we, we feels like we talk about every week and, and, you know, again, for those of us, you know, the, the, um, you know, the old folks who've been doing this work for, for so long, you know, there's such a distinction in, in live music and, you know, industry between what is kind of music community versus like what is the live music industry. And ever since we went down the path of, of massive consolidation in the late 90s and, and in other parts of the century, there's really been a bifurcation in terms of, you know, what are community spaces like and, 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 and what are, what's their function and what's their role and something that... Y- you know, I, I want to be really clear. I am not one of those people who are like, yay, COVID happened. So we, you know, could reset, you know, I don't, I don't, I wish we've never, I mean, obviously like this is such a tragedy and it's been such a disaster, but I, I do think one of the sort of heartening aspects that, that, that we've seen is, is the ability for the United States, you know, for the first time to really echo a lot of the activism and organizing that we've seen, you know, especially with Music Venue Trust and other you know, places in Europe to basically put down a flag to say, there is something that is very different and important and critical to music ecosystems about community venues, about independent venues, and they serve you know, a fundamental role that we do not value through our political structures. We don't value through our economic structures. They're not protected. They're not, you know, and, and if you take away the ladder of venues, you don't have music. And so, uh, you know, I know you've been deeply involved in the NEVA organizing, and I'd love for you to just to share, you don't have to do the whole story, but just a minute or so about like, what was your perspective about the National Independent Venue Association coming along? And, you know, again, the notion that, you know, and I don't have the power to jinx anything, but the notion that $10 billion of support is now, you know, on the table. I mean, that's mm-hmm. a massive number, you know, for, the, for arts advocates. I mean, we think about, you know, the annual NEA budget being $147 million, you know, and the entire corporation public broadcasting budget being around $600 million, you know, $10 billion going towards independent music venues is transformative as a concept. And just talk a little bit, Sean, about like how you were able to, you know, be part of the process of connecting, mm-hmm. you know, with all the other, you know, sort of leaders in an organic movement that then has gotten to, to this point. Yeah, well, it's, it's, it's been probably the thing that's kept me sane throughout all of this. And it's because there are people all across the country in the same situation. What we saw six months ago before Neva existed was this almost explosion um, coming out of um, independent venue week and the work that uh, mm-hmm. Moose was mm-hmm. doing there uh, very quickly kind of coming together in the form of national independent venue association I think initially probably under 250 venues um, six months ago when it started up to over 2,800. And, uh, you know, I've been involved in the lobbying committee and the local organizing committee, um, which are, which are really linked because it's, it's lobbying kind of at all levels. Um, And the, what you what you see and what we the feedback we get in talking to people who are in the organizing space and in the lobbying space is the the effort, uh, the passion of the people doing the advocating, but then also the the grassroots movement. Seeing that we were able to get more than two million messages to Congress in in a short space of time um, really sent the message that it's important to a lot of people. And then because we aren't running our clubs, we have the time to actually educate a lot of the politicians on what our role in the community is. And a lot of them have done fundraisers in our spaces. um, So they know us, um, but they also know that, you know, when we put out the cry for help, a lot of people called them and said, help them. And, and it began an education process. Um, not just with politicians, but also um, what we're seeing, especially through the local organizing, is there are different avenues. Um, In some cities that have seen success, like uh, Austin just last night, five five million passed uh, for 
local venues. Nashville, in the last two weeks, had two million pass. Um, there are different avenues to work. Uh, in some cases, it's the tourism bureau and being associated mm -hmm. with that. Um, in Cleveland, we've been deeply involved with the nonprofit and the individual artist community. And I think one of the great things we're seeing coming out of Cleveland, Ohio, Ohio Citizens, and we see it in California with California Citizens for the Arts, is this acceptance that the arts and culture sector is a much broader um, entity, needs to be a much broader entity, it always has been, than just the traditional nonprofit sector. Because so many people are involved, and when you, when you look at how many people are affected um, by the shutdown in the performing arts and the arts generally, uh, I think there's a growing realization that we all need, yes, we are all in it together, but that means, that means we're actually in it. Traditionally, we haven't been in it. Um, one of the great things in Cleveland is in our appeal for money on the local level, we were able to do a joint request with the nonprofit community and the individual artist community. Um, we're, we haven't gotten money yet, but we're making progress. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, for me, seeing, seeing COVID as a catalyst for understanding the sector better yeah. is, is huge. Well, and, and, and I think there, there are two sort of concepts that, that we, we talk about forever, which are, you know, bordering on cliche, but, but one is, you know, policy gets made by who, those who show up. And, mm -hmm. and I think, you know, what, what this year has shown is, that a sector that did not have a natural constituency on Capitol Hill has been able to be extremely um, effective. And, and that's because of the second piece, which is what is the difference between catharsis and strategy? And, you know, in our social media world, it's very easy for us all to shout at the moon and just be, you know, whatever, just, you know, kind of say our piece, which is really important, you know, and, and it's very important for mental health, it's important for a lot of things. But when you're able to, to connect that energy into an unbelievably, you know, sort of, um, tactile and step-by-step -step strategy that involves grassroots act activism, involves inside the Beltway lobbying, involves messaging and, and press. I mean, it's the whole thing. So anyway, we don't need to take the whole time talking about this stuff, but, um, you know, we, we've said this before in the show and, and we'll continue to say it that, um, you know, this collective effort that, that Neva and many other organizations have been able to spearhead is, is, has really been transformative, not only in terms of getting desperately needed aid into the ecosystem, hopefully getting good news in the next 48 hours, um, but also fundamentally changing, you know, kind of moving the goalposts about what is possible and what are the conversations that we as a community need to have at the federal level, especially, you know, if there's a change administration, again, not that these are partisan issues, but that if a new team comes in, we can really rethink how we want to engage with them. Um, so, yeah. um, so, Oh, I, would just, I would just say one yeah. other thing, you know, one of the great things, um, you know, Dana Frank at First Avenue is, is one of our leaders and Audrey Fink yeah. Schaefer down at uh, yeah. IMP in 930. Yeah. Um, what we, what has been great is how inclusive that movement has been. And the fact that is that if you run clubs, I mean, you work hard, you don't necessarily our screens because most of the work you do um, comes to fruition after 9 p.m. Yep. But, um, you know, having freed ourselves up to, to focus um, and, and taking that community spirit and taking our lead from, from Dana and from Audrey and all of the folk in Neva, um, it's just been, it's really what's kept a lot of us sane. So yeah. thanks. Exactly. No, thank you, Sean. And Leandra, bringing you into the conversation. So, you're joining us today from Arts Cleveland, and, and we enjoyed having you and your former colleague Megan on the show uh, earlier this year and, and kind of giving us a lay of the land in terms of, of Arts Cleveland. So we don't need to unpack a lot of that stuff. People can go back and watch the archive if they're interested. But, you know, what is your – tell me about Cleveland. What should we know about Cleveland in terms of the broader art scene, in terms of how music fits into that? And, um, you know, what is the – like – what are the characteristics of the community that, that you would really want people to know about, especially if you haven't had time, a lot of time to spend in Cleveland? Wow, yeah. Cleveland is a very musical city. Um, we have, I would say, a very like broad 
um, broad uh, music scene in terms of like different kinds of venues, some venues that um, just have like more of a theater kind of feel and then other venues that have uh, more of a, like just they have, they have bars and clubs and serve food. Um, and I mean, our arts and culture sector is just very, very diverse. We have um, all sorts of um, smaller um, arts organizations, bigger arts organizations. I mean, um, we have Playoff Square, we have um, just all sorts of venues. And so um, it's a very, very diverse scene, um, just a lot to offer in terms of music, in terms of arts and culture. And uh, that's where our work has really been involved in um, more recently. Um, we, we typically have worked with individual artists in our work and um, the arts and culture sector in terms of nonprofits, but more recently we've been getting involved in work with um, like the for-profit um, music venues and um, organizations like that. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of how our work has diversified lately and just um, getting more involved in those kinds of circles, I would say, for sure. Yeah, and, and we've really gotten such a kick out of getting to know you all through uh, Cleveland being one of our REVS pilot cities. Um, again, which for those who, who don't know, that's the Reopen Every Venue Safely initiative that um, Music Policy Forum and, and uh, our partners at Sound Music Cities have been, been running. Could you speak a little bit about what the REVS process has meant for you and Arts Cleveland and, and give a little bit of an update in terms of, of where you are at this stage? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, our I, I guess just like, being involved in this kind of thing. Um, part of the reason I got involved in this work, first of all, is because I'm a musician, and so I'm really passionate about this kind of work. And so um, it just really diversified our work and um, got me involved in something that I really enjoy, um, but also it's just like part, to, part of the arts and culture sector. Um, but I think just in terms of um, REVS, I'm just gonna take us back a little bit um, to the beginning of the summer and when our work started. And so, I would say um, back in June, we started the work and we had probably about six or seven meetings with a consistent group of um, seven or eight people representing the local, local venues on each call that we had. And um, as I said before, these venues kind of included um, bars and clubs that serve food and have live music. And then also these venues that are more like concert halls or theater like setups. And um, yeah, Megan Van Boris, the previous CEO of Arts Cleveland uh, facilitated conversations with this group and then I kind of just um, took notes during the conversations and would just kind of after, afterwards share them, um, organize them and then share them with the group. And like after we had our first meeting, we kind of just um, determined the different um, problems and issues and kind of made, um, um, and like put them into themes and kind of just discovered that the different themes that came out of that first meeting, that first conversation. And I would say the main theme that kind of popped up for um, us was safety. So just thinking about um, safety of the different people groups that would be coming to the venue. And so this included musician safety, employee safety, audience safety, things like that. And then we also just kind of discussed some other themes um, such as um, communications with audience members, um, just making sure they know what to expect before they come to your venue and things like cleaning procedures and also just um, making sure that we communicate, the venues communicate with agents and managers of the musicians and things like that. And so we kind of felt like at a certain point that we got all the information that we needed and the venues felt the same way that they had kind of told us everything that was concerning them and all that we needed to know. And so we figured, okay, it's time to kind of put this all into um, our one single document. And so I kind of struggled at first with figuring out how to organize that document, but over time just kind of realized that the themes that we had talked about in our meetings were kind of a really great way to start organizing the document. And so the document just um, starts off talking about um, cleaning procedures. And I should also mention that our document is in the very final stages. It actually might be finished. Might just need to take a look at it one more time to make sure everything is in there, but we're really close to being finished with it. And so that's exciting. And, um, yeah, so like I said before, we just kind of touched on things like cleaning procedures. We touched on musician safety and management, just con communicating um, what's expected in the venue to agents and managers um, so the musicians know before they show up and that can help keep them safe, just knowing um, how to do load in and things like that in order to keep the musicians safe and to protect them from other people that are also at the venue helping with that process. Um, we talked about employee safety, so just things like 
having a plexiglass shield up at the bar to protect them from the audience and things like that. And then we talked about audience safety. And so thinking things, thinking about things such as timed entry, mm -hmm. having the patrons arrive at different times. And so they're not all waiting in a line close to each other, things like that. And just having floor stickers that, sh that are six feet apart. So they know, you know, where to stand and things like that. And um, just at the end of the document, we, we kind of included just a resource section. Um, and I should mention as well in our, our meetings, um, that we had in June and July. They were mostly attended by um, representatives of the local venues, um, but we actually sh ended up sharing our document at the end of the process with um, some of our connections in the local public health sector and also some musicians that we know as well. And we're able to get feedback on the document from them because we really valued those kinds of opinions as well. Um, and so I think that the document is really thorough and, and will be really helpful to the people who needed in the music sector. And yeah, so our, our next step is basically just in terms of that, um, thinking about release strategy and um, just working on getting that out to the people who need it. And, it's yeah. such a great update, Leandra. And, and, you know, our, on the national level phase that we're moving aggressively into, again, is at the point of revs is not only to provide support for 11 pilot cities, but is, is to try to consolidate the lessons that each community came up with as they went through this local process and try to synthesize that into useful information that could be relevant for every other city that has not had a, a res type initiative right. happening locally. And so it, it's a daunting task to synthesize, you know, Cleveland and Austin and Seattle and everybody's had their own experience in this, in this, you know, multi-month, um, you know, sort of uh, journey we've been on. Um, but more to come on, on that front, but hopefully in October, we're, we're gonna be able to, to finally release some national recommendations that can benefit other cities. I think we all collectively are feeling the pressure. You know, you see Tennessee reopening, you see Florida reopening. We know a lot of our colleagues that run venues or are involved in music communities across the country are dealing with uh, reopening timelines that may not be um, uh, prioritizing some of the same scientific information as others may want to prioritize. Was that political enough? Anyway, they may be moving faster than some of our other communities um, that would like to see, particularly Deandre, to your point, I'll bring Mark and, and Jill in at, at this stage, but you know, something that has been incredibly heartening to all of us on the Revs team is to see organically how each of our pilot cities were so laser focused on the safety and health of musicians and crew and venue workers and audiences, of course, but that, you know, the, the, the conversation, you know, quickly turned to how do we keep our people safe and how do we communicate that out to them so they know that we're really thinking about this as a community and as a family, not sort of as, um, you know, other sort of priorities around, around business. So, so one of the things that's super neat about the, super neat, one of the things that we really enjoyed about the Cleveland pilot was that you had a regional approach. And, and so Mark and Jill, you, you both spend a lot of time in Akron and, and work in Akron. Maybe Jill, I could start with you. Could you talk a little bit about your venue and what it's been like to kind of be part of the Revs conversation as more of a, again, a regional approach as, as opposed to just one city? Michael, absolutely. Thanks for having us. Um, I own Jilly's Music Room in downtown Akron, which is a 250 cap um, live music and entertainment venue. We uh, have something going on or did have something going on every day of the week. Um, Akron is a, is a really cool place. It's been joked about for many years that we've got sort of one of everything. So we've got, you know, one taco, taco restaurant, one, you know, punk venue, one country venue, one um, big theater, one mini theater. It's a, it's a great town. It's a super creative place to be. We've got an incredibly engaged and um, community driven um, music family there. And uh, regionally, I mean, this has been, I think this has been really important. And I think that, I don't know if there is a silver lining in COVID anywhere, it's that it's brought an industry that is often working in silos um, together to hash out best practices and commiserate and, and work together on things. And it's, um, it's only strengthened us, and, which is, kind of an amazing feeling um, to be part of something that is just so incredibly strong and positive and working towards a better future, whether it's a, you know, a, a reset, a semi-reset, a, a, 
uh, uh, whatever it is, the, the concept of working together has been really fantastic. And that it is that Revs in particular has brought both the, the nonprofit arts and culture family together with the for-profit venues um, has been, has been really wonderful um, and, and strengthens every city as a whole because we all know how important arts and culture is to our cities. And with that, I'll lead it to Mark. Yeah, Mark, what would, um, I mean, you've worn a lot of different hats in the community over a period of, of time. Um, so you've done a lot of work on, you know, in terms of touring acts, you've, you've been involved in festival production. I mean, you've just, you've done it all. You know, what has it been, you know, sort of jumping in, you know, to this work in 2020 and, and trying to kind of figure out how do we get this, this up and running as quickly and safely as we can? Well, first of all, I just wanted to give a shout out to Megan Bendoris to, you know, not only pull us all together in Northeastern Ohio as a satellite uh, area for REVs, but also she also brought a lot of the clubs together as well. So each week I look forward to my REVs call and my clubs call. Um, I, I've been in Cleveland for you know, since 1985, been in the music business since 85. Yes, I've wore many hats. I spent many years on the road to musicians. I know where they're coming from. I know what their concerns are. I know what they're thinking. But one thing that came up today that I, I found very interesting I'd like to share with everybody was the idea of the two sections, if we will, of the one being music community and the other being music industry. When I started my tenure, I was part of the music industry. And now as I work in my ten, as I, in my second part of my tenure at a venue person, I am now part of the music community. Um, always supported the music community for many years traveling, often got fistfights with people, whether it be Europe or LA, people making fun of Cleveland, I'd say, yeah, you wish you could be as cool as us. So um, I think that in, in taking this this document, creating this document, being part of Revs, is to to you know take the information that we've learned, compile that information we learned, and make it into a living piece of work. Make it into a living document so that we can share it with other places in the Northeastern Ohio area that are not part of the gang, that are not part of the you know the weekly contingent. Um, I, I just, you know, our venue is 1,450. In Ohio, we're up 50% of our manifested capacity as far as being able to allow someone into a ticketed event. So if I was to do a show, that puts me at 220 people. It's very borderline economically feasible for us, but there is a lot of what ifs that are involved. Um, that, you know, I, I just want to make it known that a lot of this is common sense. A lot of this is empathy to your audience, to your employees, to your artists. A lot of it is your best practices putting forward. Then also just to communicate, whether it's your public health official, whether it's your audience, whether it's your band, whether it's your staff, whether it's the agency, the booking agency that you're talking to. You know, well, and, and Sean, I'd, I'd welcome you back in the conversation if you have comments on this. You know, one of the, this is for, for everybody, one of the most remarkable dynamics of the REVS process from our standpoint, and, and again, to stress, our model is that we are not prescriptive. Our model is that each community has their own dynamics, their own conversations, their own, you know, they ran the thing. And then our job at the national level is to try to synthesize and connect dots across communities. And and, you know, especially as we came to grips with the really hard understanding that the timeline was not what we hoped it would be, right? When we launched this thing in, in April, you know, we were hoping that by Labor Day we'd be in a fundamentally different place. And it only became clear we're not going to be in that place. Many of the communities that were working on the reopening conversations, you know, really did a, a little bit of a pivot. And even though they still talked about reopening, they also talked about reimagining. And, and, and really rethinking what are we doing as a community and, and how do we link up the broader social justice conversations that are happening in our streets 
and the conversations about equity and, 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 and fairness and social justice and, and how does that play into what's happening in our cultural scene. And I'm just curious, and, and that's something that we're doing now, you know, again, on, that's a big part of what's happening in the Music Policy Forum Laboratory is figuring out how do we merge these conversations and the power of collaborate across community collaboration and put that in a 2021 context, you know, beyond just reopening. So we're thinking a lot about that, but I would just throw out to you all, what does kind of reimagining look like? What are things that these collaborations that you all are having and, and something else I want to lift up that I don't think you all had a chance to emphasize is the deep relationships you have with local and statewide policymakers that you have these meaningful, deep sort of connections at every level of government what what is that you know do you have any thoughts about what that looks like you know kind of moving forward um around kind of reimagining how we can be doing things better other than again simply trying to make it to a reopening standpoint sure um i mean i think i think there are a lot of different ways things are getting reimagined um you know my focus is less on on how do we how do we move to streaming? How do we how do we do that kind of work? And it's much more focused on on the policy work and how do we get our voices heard. Um, but what's great is this community is big enough that um, some people are focused on figuring out what can we do in the streaming space, what can we do to safely bring people together where we can. But um, you know, for me certainly. I think we'll see a lot of the people who were involved in this movement getting involved in um, in policy making in all kinds of different forms, whether that's running for office or creating offices at, at local levels to address these issues or getting people involved in policy making, not even just specifically around music, but around uh, all sorts of uh, local government thinking because we bring a passion and a sense of community. So for me, there's, there's that piece of it, but I'll, I'll leave it to others to, to share their reimaginings too. Yeah, I think, does, yeah, please, thank you, John. Oh, sorry, yeah, I think no. this is definitely giving us a, a really big chance to reimagine how we go forward. We're going to be doing and trying things that we haven't before because the traditional, you know, bringing, bringing the audience into our venues and bringing the audience that we need to help sustain our venues long-term is going to take some time. And as, as we grow back to where we were or better than where we were or different than where we were, we're, we're gonna be doing different things. I started um, at the end of May doing a weekly live stream, um, you know, from our stage to your couch kind of thing and bringing in once a week a, a favorite regional band to, to do a stream. And so far it's been, it's been really successful and we offer it for free. Um, this will probably be something that we keep up as we reopen um, because there will be so many more people who will want to stay home but still in, be able to enjoy that live music experience, um, but maybe they aren't ready to go out yet. And I think this is going to be, you know, just one of the new things that we, that we do, that we continue to do and continue to offer our audiences and, and fans going forward. And, and I think, you know, we, we definitely are seeing, you know, when we talk about reimagining, we're, we're definitely seeing like the micro things, like we have tools that we didn't have before people are becoming more accustomed to streaming. I mean, we've got those kind of distribution things. We also have the sort of bigger macro sort of dynamics that the industry that we inherited, the industry as of Christmas day, 2019 was not particularly functioning. You know, I mean, there were, there, there were structural major flaws that many of us have been working on for a long time. And part of the, the opportunity, and I would look at it as an opportunity, not a challenge, but the opportunity is as we've had more time to collaborate, in part because we've had time, literally, because we're not put on rock shows and things, but as we've had more time to get, get together in terms of a Neva or in terms of a Cleveland Revs community or others, we have an opportunity to kind of question some of the basic assumptions about like, why are we just sort of living under these kind of structural failings and, and start to be you know, kind of thoughtful about what could a different future look like, you know, and, and that can be some communities are really looking at arts and education. Some people are looking at, um, you know, how are we engaging with public media? Some people are thinking about what does it look like in the future when we actually have real antitrust enforcement? You know, what is a structural antitrust conversation going to look like 
and how can that impact the economics of music on across all sectors? I mean, so there's really interesting, um, really, in, there's a lot of potential we see, you know, and I think a lot of people see out of having, again, not only the local relationships that have been, been, been really tended to this year, but also the cross community relationships. I don't know. I don't mean to ask you to, I'm sorry, I'm speech fine, but, um, okay. if anybody has, Michael, a, I, t- yeah, yeah I would, I would jump in, you know, one of the things we've, we've known, but haven't been able to communicate clearly is in, in many places, these live music venues are neighborhood anchors, exactly. both cultural and economic development. And we treat other anchors, bigger anchors, um, differently. Um, so when you're looking at um, this movement towards using arts districts to, to push economic development, realizing that if you're relying on people who are doing this from, from a pure grassroots perspective, who are creating value, um, how do you let them share in that value instead of monetizing it and turning it over in tax abatements to real estate developers who are much more adept in the policy yeah. field? Um, so I think it'll be interesting to see if we see for like we've seen in the UK um, to try and secure these spaces and, and protect some of the people who are creating this value. No, I, I appreciate that very much, Sean. And, and I think, and, and we're actually, we're, we're at times, so we're going to have to wrap, but I think, you know, hopefully what, what our audience has had a chance to see today is, is it's been so interesting to see again, the role of Arts Cleveland as the convener and as an, as an organization that is cross-discipline that has sort of, you know, tentacles all over the broader arts and culture scene the ability to, again, have a regional approach. So it's not just like our, you know, sort of zip codes, but it's like, okay, let's think about how we all, you know, sort of can be rowing together. The deep integration with the local policymakers, the ability to that tap up into the national, you know, sort of political conversations. And, and I think, you know, most importantly, what I just like to leave with is just this, this call to action, I hope that we all feel which is that ultimately, you know, we can't define success around like saving our stages and reopening our venues. It's really about how do we take this and build momentum and build power and, and really have agency to create the structures that we'd like to see in the future that are, again, going to be more equitable, more music friendly, more musician friendly, more audience friendly, and really, you know, kind of recognize the value of music in ways that structurally we probably you know, really have not been able to do very well in this country, uh, certainly for the last, you know, 30, 40 years. Oh my God, I just went <laughs> speechifying. You see when the producer's away, then I just talk and all that. So um, huge thanks uh, to our Ohio friends. Thank you, Leandra, Sean, Jill, and Mark uh, for today and for all your great work with Revs and with Neva. Thanks again to Kelly and Trevor for their great work with West Staff and CV Suite and all that great stuff. Um, again, thank you so much to audience members for participating and watching today. Um, as always, we welcome uh, suggestions, questions, comments, and as we always say, very gentle, constructive criticism, musicpolicyforum at gmail.com is a great way to get us. Um, thank you. Have a great uh, rest of your week, and we'll talk to you all next week. Thank you.